What's up, guys? GM. What's up, what's up? GM, GM, everybody in the kitchen, we're about to get started. soon, so if you want to learn Solidity, uh, talk to me after this uh, session. A um, couple other questions for you guys, just, just for fun. Like, was anybody affected by SVB? Yeah? No. Okay. Tangentially. Tangentially, yeah. yeah. So, Wait, can you say that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so what a crazy, yeah, so, so it affected USDC, right? And yeah. I knew a lot of people that, that panic sold. Did anyone here panic sell? They got scared? Chevy looked like a Luna situation? <laughs> sort of. <laughs> On the other hand, there was people that wanted to. I think it went to like 87, 87 cents, which is wild for a stable coin. It's supposed to be kind of dollar. Um, but there were people that wanted it on leverage, which is a crazy move. Um, so, anyways, what a fun weekend. Um, that's just a couple of things to get started. So, uh, welcome, guys. My name's uh, Chad. I go by GM Chad on Twitter. Um, this is going to be a fireside with uh, Julian from Enzo and Sean from Relay. Um, and so, let's give them a, a round of applause. Um, so real quick guys, do you guys want to give some, some introductions um, on yourselves and your backgrounds and then we'll just jump right in. Maybe you can start, Julianne. So I'm Julianne. I also go by Jules for some of you. Um, I'm originally from San Francisco, but I've been living in Spain for the last four and a half years. So I came here for five months and then now have been kind of no make or no matting around. Um, I started, Mitsu, should I give like a quick intro like my career? Yeah, sure. Um, I started as an entrepreneur when I was 15. I actually had a swimsuit company 
and raised money off that and basically pitched, did a bunch of entrepreneurial things that I never thought I would do it at that age. And then I moved to Spain, basically worked in VC for the last four and a half years, and then decided that that was boring. And <laughs> I went to all the crypto conferences and basically traveled around for like a year and a half, and then started Enzo back in October. And currently, now I'm here in San Diego, going to San Francisco next, um, we're building a digital social closet built on top of Lens Protocol. And we're focusing on curation and the creator economy and how creators can actually monetize off their work. So whether it's fashion, lifestyle, um, merch, they can actually collect it, have a place like a gallery to showcase it, and then be able to create like communities like it. Awesome. Uh, so I grew up up in the 15 here in RB, Poway area. Uh, went to Berkeley for a school where I got acquainted with Bitcoin back in 2012, 2013, and graduated and was working as a software engineer in the Bay Area. And 2015, I went to a, a lot of meetups. There's like VR meetups, there was some crypto meetups back then. Um, I went to one meetup where there's 10 people in a bar in Oakland talking about how Ripple is going to change the world. And two months later, I went to a meetup around Ethereum, and I was like, all right, this, this one's a little, uh, a little different, <laughs> little different, different vibes. Um, and so, I've been in the community since. Um, I went to the first uh, ETH Global Hackathon in Waterloo in 2017. Um, did a hack around this new stablecoin called uh, DAI, made by MakerDAO. And I joined that team for the next two years. Then I did a year at Infrira with Consensus. And in 2021, I started uh, Relay. And our first name for it is actually called DAO Panel. It's a way to communicate as your Web3 persona, and like a control panel for the DAOs you're part of. And I'll go into a little pivots and some of the founding story of that. But uh, yeah, that's my background. Right on, awesome stories. Um, we're definitely gonna get more into, into both of the companies. Um, but one question I love to ask, I think Sean, you kind of touched on this, but what do you think led, led you guys to, uh, to get into the Web3 space, right? Like what's that like journey into it? Everybody's got a different story. It's usually like ad hoc, like meetups in your case. Maybe Julian, you can hear yourself, like you said you were doing VC and it was boring, but how'd you find the space? Yeah, so, all the partners that I was working with actually thought crypto was fake. And <laughs> I swear, we're in these meetings and all day I'm hearing about these, we just invested in like a bunch of SaaS companies. Um, it was a fund based in Europe, but we had also offices in, in Miami. And literally everyone, was, they were all like over the age of 60. I think a lot of them, well, I'm not gonna say that. but. <laughs> They all thought it was fake, and me, like I was super curious. I wanted to, one, go travel, but then also I wanted to like understand what everyone was talking about. Luckily, I have a sister who was in the space, and she helped gear me, and like, I went with her to all these different conferences, and basically just started talking to everyone. And I remember, I actually met Sean at East Denver, and I remember talking to him for the first time, and I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but then like, like, I became so much more curious, and I decided to talk to every single person and figure out you know, what, what they were building, what they were passionate about, and how I could fit into that. Um, and for me, it was a lot of like the creative side. So the Web3 social media I really enjoyed, digital fashion, um, the combination between physical and fashion uh, and digital, and then also on-chain merch. Any of you have seen like the Lens merch or the Aave merch, um, they're pretty famous. But I just, it was so incredible to me to see just all this space and people that actually were curious. And I think that's what it was for me. Yeah, so you went from like thinking crypto was fake or being surrounded by people yeah. that thought crypto was fake to going to ETH Denver, which is arguably one of the most like high signal events for crypto. Right? Oh, it was crazy. Yeah. I remember I was like, half the time I was like, okay, we're here at 9 a.m. talking about all these things that I don't understand. And then they're there at like 10 p.m. partying, pretty drunk. <laughs> 
we're coding, we're watching Diplo at the same time. I was like, what is this? <laughs> or like coming with your backpack with all, like from the hackathon and then going to go watch Diplo. I was like, what industry is this? I didn't understand it. But then at the same time, it was so interesting. I was like, how can you balance both of those things? No, it's, it's amazing. 2021 was eight times, which is like not Oh, it's crazy. Um, if you, I think it was white. Yeah, who, who went to, to eight times last, last year? Okay, cool. Oh, yeah, four, four folks. Okay, awesome. It's amazing. Yeah, 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 for sure. The vibe was a little bit different this year, for sure. There was yeah. no famous DJs, except for this one. <laughs> <laughs> song. Yeah. You're there for the DJs. <laughs> I mean, that's why I got into crypto for the DJs. <laughs> Uh, we're definitely going to go with and the DJs. Uh, and the DJs. Uh, we'll go into East Denver a little bit and talk about events. But um, real quick, Sean, like you mentioned meetups, right? Maybe you can to break down those meetups specifically. And what was different about the Ethereum meetup versus uh, the other meetups you were going to at the time? Yeah, um, I think this was 2015, 2016. And the most common question when you meet someone back then was, uh, oh, like, how'd you get into crypto? Like, how'd you get into blockchain? And because it was this very niche, uh, very niche thing. And most people were like, oh, like I use Bitcoin in college. And it's because like local Bitcoins and like, the, the idea of like having money separate from any uh, government control and like any uh, just like nations. And so like, it's very much like a, a very liberal, like crypto liberal, like escape from uh, like the Federal Reserve type of thing. That was like the main thing why people got into it. Um, and the meetups, like when Ethereum came out, it was the first thing to not only guarantee, guarantee like Bitcoin, like the money would be decentralized, but also the compute and having the idea of running your own software programs that would be guaranteed to be run around the world. And like just the idea is that it sparked in people's heads. Um, it's very much like a time of like theory crafting and like imagining kind of like the app store in 2008. And all of a sudden, it was like the Ethereum uh, programming in 2015, 2016. And, so obviously taking a ton of time to build up all the, the dev tools and the, the infrastructure to get there, but it's, it was basically like imagining people's heads back then. And so I started the, there's, at the time there's a Silicon Valley Ethereum developers meetup. And so like everyone would drive an hour south to meet up and talk about Ethereum back in 2015. And I started the first meeting of the San Francisco Ethereum developers meetup. So uh, it's a local, um, one probably most interesting story is that I hosted the meetup, about uh, 60 people showed up in the very first meetup, and we talked about uh, kind of a opaque, obscure, like legal ramifications of crypto. <coughs> and at the end of the meetup, um, a man came up to me and asked me about Ethereum, and I was like, oh, like, yeah, it's like, great. Um, he's like, cool, like, uh, I have Coinbase, like, you guys should come out. And so I basically, this is, I talked to Brian Armstrong before Coinbase added Ethereum. And, I, I, I take some small part in helping them, <laughs> helping them like uh, expand beyond Bitcoin. Yeah, um, that's amazing. I, I didn't know that. Um, um, that's huge. Yeah. The one of the best things that I've seen is on Sean's Facebook. He had he was in a fraternity, and basically, he wrote in there. He was like, "Hey, everyone should invest in Ethereum." And what I said, was this? I was in like a Berkeley like <laughs> computer de developers. Uh, uh, engineering fraternity, they had it. Um, and so I, when the Ethereum white paper came out, I posted about it in the group and said like, hey guys, this is pretty cool, check it out. And like, it's timestamps, like, you know, like, uh, it was like November 2015, this is like November 2015. And then like six years later, someone posted the thread like, imagine buying Ethereum back then. <laughs> <laughs> you should, you should make that on, on Enzo, maybe? I know, that's I what know. I was thinking. I was like, wait a second, memory, hey. Um, Okay, that, that, that's an amazing story. I think uh, something that resonated was like you mentioned e uh, Ethereum was like this gap, uh, this app store, right? And like traditionally, like with Bitcoin, it was really hard to develop like applications on top of it. Like all you have is Bitcoin scripts. Ethereum unlocked this this opportunity by providing a Turing complete language to build on top of. Um, and that's kind of how I found Ethereum as well, was realizing that it's a lot easier to build on it. So I love that analogy. Um, let's fast forward just a little bit. Uh, you guys are both founders, right? And to anybody that's, that's uh, looking to found a company, what advice would you give to uh, young entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs that are looking to uh, found their next company? Um, I really recommend two things. One is going to hackathons, and two is taking advantage of 
the resources out there, like the the ten week, like if you're not if you're not well versed in coding, uh, take advantage of these like ten week courses that take you from level one JavaScript to level ten Solidity and like able to deploy an app in the front end, um, and then first do that, and then basically from other ideas in your life, like whatever hobbies you have, whatever interests, crypto can touch on a lot of those different things, and you bring your own experience to a hackathon, you just build something cool like over the weekend, whatever you're passionate about, maybe you join another team, um, and if there's some, some spark or some magic there, like that's, like you have a, a weekend of hard building and like you have judges and VCs kind of looking at the results, and that's an amazing platform to springboard and like trying to launch a pre-seed and like raise the money to start that. Um, so that's what I recommend. Real quick on that, what about for like non-technical founders? Um, that can, can they still go to hackathons and, and what kind of value can they add at a hackathon? Yeah, like if there's, yeah, definitely yes. Um, I, I think we can get into it a little bit, but like the tools out there for working with code, if you haven't done it, like ChatGPT is a thing now. Um, designing it, um, but also most hackathons are, they try to get together teams of four, so I was like, on four people with the team, there's a, a lot of ability to either do the marketing, the designs, um, kind of the business plan, and just there's different spheres of a project, or different facets of a project that you can help with. Definitely. Uh, how about you, Julian? What, what kind of advice would you give to, to entrepreneurs looking to, to Yeah, so project? I also second that. Hackathon, when you're in, like, process of just understanding like what you want to build. A lot of times you also have no idea what you want to do. You you come up with this maybe this idea but you need validation and Hackathon is amazing for that. And as a non technical founder, going to Hackathon, I remember I went to DevCon where I actually met most of my team members and I sat there for like six hours and we just did like a whole ideation uh, for literally for six hours. And a lot of hackers that go are very technical, or they're non-technical, but they're there to learn and also like structure. And I came with more like business operations experience, and for me it was so exciting because like we mapped out different ideas and how that flow would, that product would flow, and then basically they were like, okay, let's go build it, and that was for me that was incredible. I was like, wow, this is so cool. And I also believe like you really need to start like shipping products. Like when you're first, um, like every mentor that I've had have, has told me the same thing. Um, if you have an idea, map it out, ask for feedback, a lot of feedback, also mentorship is super important. Ask for feedback and try it out. If it doesn't work, it's fine. What, what was wrong? And also you actually create better ideas through that process. And I 100% recommend that, like you can basically you don't even have to code now. You can create your own smart contract on so many different platforms. Like one is Third Web, for example. You can make it so easy in like five minutes, and you can launch your own project. And you can do it alone, and you can do it with no funding. And basically, you can sell anything, kind of like a Shopify um, store. So I 100% recommend trying it out and putting it in practice. And if you're not a technical person, just ask a bunch of questions. A lot of times, like they're so willing to, like if you get, you go on Discord and just ask, like maybe a couple of questions, people will respond to you, and that's like the most amazing thing about this Web three space, is that people are so, like, curious to also understand your background and you know what you think is the next big thing, because you might have amazing ideas and they might have the technical experience to do it. So. Yeah, I, I think. Uh, go ahead. I wanted to add, so like. Uh, these like hackathons obviously there's sponsors and um, has anyone like or show of hands like who hasn't done a hackathon before? Or, so like usually the way it works is like say there's 20 different sponsors. I think Denver had almost 100, but usually most of these are platforms that are wanting developers to build on top of them. And so they have APIs and like uh, they sponsor bounties where if you do a hack with them, you might get two thousand dollars at the end of it if you're like the best hack related to it. And so just by picking three or four different projects and kind of combining them in a novel way, and maybe bring in one outside API, non crypto related, like um, it's like Third Web and then Ceramic for the data storage, Live Crew for the video, and say you're a runner, so if you pull in Strava API, and that, all of a sudden that's like, no one's ever done that before. And so that's like conceivably a new startup, like if you can get that working. So 
I'd recommend like looking at the sponsors and they kind of have requests for startups where these are sometimes like very well funded companies that are looking for startups to build on top of them and so that's a great resource to use. And also a lot of those protocols have grants so even after the hackathon you can still go back on their website and if you, you've probably spoken to one or two of the people running the grants program and you can literally ask them after and then apply for a grant and go with your reasoning of what you did for the hackathon or come up with a whole new idea. And grants are amazing resources. We were talking about that earlier. Like grants for literally anything, for events, um, for just building something new and trying them out. Because all these protocols also want you to use their technology or the SDAs, so they want to figure out like how to better that. Yeah, honestly, like we're huge proponents of, of uh, hackathons at ETHSD. Um, specifically, like just we would fund our organization by going to hackathons and winning bounties. That's how we like got the you know the first funds to actually like host these events uh, for free and host other things like hack houses and uh, most recently our um, you know uh, our boot camp. And then that unlocked the opportunity to raise a ton of grant money because like you get a lot of face time with potential founders from huge companies, uh, from from recruiters. Um, and there's no better way to prove yourself, right? Like going to hackathon, building something, going up to them, having face time, and showing them that like you're building on a product. Um, so I agree with like every single one of the points. I think the second thing I'll say too um, is that it's the quickest feedback loop too, right? Like on getting like you know feedback on what you're doing. Like typically you have to like set up a meeting, right? Or, or pitch your idea, or uh, you know go on Discord. Like you have FaceTime directly with you know founders of huge companies or people at higher positions that can be like, yeah, this is great, we'll fund it, or yeah, like we're gonna give you bounty, or apply for a grant, you're most likely gonna get it. Um, so every, go to hackathons, go to the hackathon, even if you're not technical, um, go to it even if you're not founding a company, because there's just so much opportunity, you'll learn a ton about this space, um, and you'll meet some really awesome people. You guys know the hackathon, right? Yeah, so, there you it's go. super fun. Yeah. It's also the energy of just like building things and talking to people, and then also you make a lot of friends, which I think is, Eventually, the best part, too. Yeah. Yeah. Can't forget about the friendships. Yeah. Um, awesome. Cool. So let's dive in a little bit into both your companies, right? So let's start with you, Julian. Um, you gave us kind of a high level, and so maybe you can kind of reiterate that and talk about a little bit about the, the vision that you have um, with Enzo, and then maybe where the name came from, because I'm super curious. Okay. So maybe I'll start with that. So I actually remember it was in like September. And I kept asking all the Relay team, I was like, what should I name my company? Because I also think naming a company is one of the hardest things to do. Because one, you think you want to be different, you want to make an impact, also you want to make sure the domain is there, and that it's not too expensive, because funds are very low. Um, so Enzo means um, imperfection is actually perfect. And it comes from the idea of, um, I started my first company as a fashion company. And most designers and most artists always think that their work is not good enough. And as founders as well, we, over, we always have this high expectation of what we want. And a lot of times it's so much pressure and you never get there. But for artists and designers as well, I like it's honestly like, Everyone else thinks it's perfect. And if we look at also most of the artists who have passed away, who maybe had issues in their life and never thought their work was good enough to show the public, and then eventually it was perfect and amazing. So that's why I named it Enzo, because the whole idea behind Enzo is supporting creators, designers, artists, people who want to create content. And the vision behind Enzo is that we're focusing a lot on you know, what's gonna be the next big thing and how we're gonna onboard the next billion users onto crypto. And I view it as creators. And creators are the one, if any of you guys have kids, for example, they're always on their phone. Like an average like Gen Zer spends around three to four hours a day on their phone. And what are they doing? <laughs> Most of the times they're creating TikToks or they're on Instagram and they're trying to vision like what's gonna be the next big thing. And I see this as the future of work, that these are the, gonna be the ones that are creating content, sharing, advertising, branding, and actually building their own profile as their own business, and, and keeping it as like a new stream of income. 
And a lot of us, even today, we think all the time, we're like, oh, like, if I had maybe this amount of money more, like, per month, what would I do with it? I'd be a lot more relaxed, I could live in my dream place. And a lot of, like, kids now are all focusing on, like, oh, I don't want to go the traditional path that my parents went, <laughs> and I want to actually build it. And that, to me, is so inspiring. And the reason why I'm building Enzo is for that reason, for like giving back to creators, allowing them to monetize, monetize that on-chain, where they actually have no idea that they're using blockchain technology, but they are opening a wallet, they're posting about it, they're collecting um, posts or whatever it is, and then they're actually creating this affiliate link for that, and the attribution is tracked on-chain, so. Yeah, so let's, let's dive a little bit into that, right? Um, you call Enzo like a, a decentralized like social media application, right? But it's really geared towards fashion. So maybe you can talk a bit more about that, and then some of the activations you've recently done uh, that integrates like real world fashion uh, onto you know into blockchains. Yeah. So brands are always looking for ways of how they can reach a like better demographic. A lot of the ad spend today is wasted on basically like they don't have a clear like a lot of times they go through agencies, and agencies are super expensive. So thinking as like a founder. It's so expensive to go through these agencies. You can't reach all these micro-influencers demographic. And a lot of times we go off recommendations. And probably you've noticed yourself, if you're ever on social media, you're probably seeing what your friends are doing or people you find of influence, what they're doing, and you follow them. A lot of times you see where they've traveled, what they're, where they're going to eat. And this is a whole way, direct way, of how we should monetize through all this. And I truly think, like, this is the future. <laughs> but, um... And it starts with, like, a very pure intent of just trying to curate your own style and your own taste and your own uh, belief of what you like to see and what you believe is stylish or what you believe is worthwhile to share and curate. And, right. Yeah, and collecting in your digital closet. So a couple activations we did, and what I meant by shipping, so... I was very much encouraged to create um, this on-chain merch, and the first one was actually with Miha, which was a famous DJ. She's actually based in LA. So I did it with Miha and Boys Club, which is a woman found in DAO. Um, they call themselves the Social Club of Web3. And um, we basically launched that and launched the physical and digital at the same time and gave away the first 50 shirts at um, Miami Art Basel, and then we sold them. Uh, 50 later. Um, and it was really, oh, yeah. And it, it's on-chain merch because, and digital and physical, because it has an NFC chip in it. And basically, you can scan it and add that to your wallet. So you have that NFT, and you also can get um, a co-op from it. And you can also give away co-ops. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with a like brand name 9DCC. But basically, they kind of do the same thing. They work with IYK, they scan it. They, you can offer to give away co-ops to people you connect with. And then you can see who you've actually connected with at the end of the event or, um, yeah. So real quick, who's familiar with co-ops? OK, but most of you. Do you want to maybe break down co-ops and talk a little bit about how what, what IYK does and yeah. how that integrates into the merchandise? Yeah, so IYK basically is the hardware piece. So they're the NFC chip, and that NFC chip is connected to a link. So you can scan it with your phone, and it pulls up a link, and that link could either go to IYK's app, and basically you can see the NFT there. Normally it's like a 3D image of the shirt, and then it has, you know, you can claim it. So you can claim it with your ENS, your ETH address, and then you can um, also um, claim a pull-up, and you could also offer to give away a pull-up. And Pope is just proof of attendance. So if you came here today, um, if you guys were doing it, you could offer a Pope up. They can scan in. They can save that and see that in their wallet. And then, you know, there's so many different ways you could work with Pope's in the future, like airdrop, discounts for fashion, for example. Um, yeah, it's like kind of like a, a physical check-in, if you will, right? Um, we won't be giving pull-ups out tonight, but we might be giving out lens handles. Yeah. And Enzo is built on lens, so maybe we can just briefly talk about what lens is for those in the audience that don't know. Yeah, so lens, do any of you guys know what lens is? Or, okay, cool. Okay, so imagine lens is a social graph. So imagine lens as being the infrastructure for all the social applications that are being built today. Imagine like Facebook and then 
and on top of it, it's Instagram, it's um, Twitch, whatever. Like, imagine they were all the same thing, that you could post on one, and it literally will show on all the different applications. And we're being built on Lens Protocol because, one, I think the team is amazing. They are, um, one, it's really hard to make a decentralized social media, like very, very difficult. And it takes time, and it also takes a bunch of data. Um, and second, the team is amazing. And um, also, like building an application, like a front end on Lens, it's all about you know how many users do they have, what smart contracts are available to use, what we can take, what, what what we can use, and what we can take or um, not. But a lot of it's like building faster to start getting more data on where we need to go and what the future is of Web3 social. And yeah, like I think if you want to build a, like DAP on, on Lens, you can actually do it very quickly. Like we built ours in a month, but you can do it even quicker if you wanted to. Yeah, I, I think like the coolest, the key piece is that your followers that you make on Lens are NFTs that are permanently part of your, well, they're NFTs of yours on Polygon. And so basically every Lens app is looking at your follower list and your posts and having a different display of how it works. So there might be like a Twitter-like view, there might be an Instagram-like view, but it's all the same data and no one else can like destroy your like your deplatforming if you get banned from Twitter for whatever, for whatever reason. Like uh, that's not possible in Lens. And so that's like, that's why it's decentralized. Yeah, I think just, just to add to that, like it's essentially you're, you're sharing the network effect with um, anyone that's building on top of Lens. So just like with Ethereum, like you have this world API where you can tap into all this open data. With Lens, like you've got this, uh, I guess, social media uh, open API that anyone can tap to. So as Lens grows, uh, it rises the tide for all, all applications that are built on top of Lens. Um, and so I think we talked about this too, like building a successful product on top of Lens will bring back sort of that market into Lens, right? So if you build a successful product, you're growing essentially the user base for everybody else, and you know the network effect grows uh, for all. So kind of like positive sum games, right, are being built on Lens. Yeah, we're like in this all group chat, and it's great to also be a part of a community. Like if there's a bug or there's an issue and you yeah. need help with it, you can basically chat in there. And there, there, like it doesn't have to be someone directly from the Lens team, but it could be anyone building on top of Lens. And I think that network is incredible, especially like there's bugs all the time. There's a lot of things that if like you're coding alone, like you don't, like you're blocked. So how do you surpass that and actually get it done is through community. Yeah, I think that's, that's such a, a overlooked kind of piece of it is that there's a sh like shared responsibility model uh, for making sure that there's uptime on the infrastructure because you have all these dependencies, there's essentially all these products that are built on it. Um, so really awesome. Um, Stay tuned, we'll be giving out a Lens handle if you don't have one, and then you can explore the awesome world of decentralized social media. Um, right on, so let's pivot a little bit to, to what you're working on, Sean. Um, so tell us a little bit about Relay. Um, I'm gonna ask you how you got the name, obviously, and then you went from DAO panel to Relay, and then uh, just give us a vision of what you're building with Relay. Yeah, so it starts where you have a wallet, you have an Ethereum wallet, and it has that long string of numbers, you have a public address, and you can actually encrypt a message with that public address. Um, like public key encryption. And we're looking at ways for how uh, you can communicate as your Web3 address uh, when you're communicating in DAOs or when you're just being involved in this crypto world. A lot of people, like, they still do, you drop down and use Telegram, you use Discord, um, but you actually have the tools to communicate as your Web3 persona. Um, and so we started to build this November 20, 2021. Um, and then in April, uh, a great team called XNTP came out with their beta SDK which does exactly what we're trying to do. So we kind of slotted that into what we're building. And we we're the first partner, like the first team to build front end clients uh, for that XMP protocol, where you basically have a, you have an Ethereum wallet, you can communicate with any other Ethereum wallet. It's end-to-end -end encrypted, uh, decentralized, and that's just a great communication protocol. Um, so we're building products on top of that. And uh, throughout the year, like it was great, but it wasn't like, up into the right growth that you'd expect, like you want us, your startup to have. Um, and so in November, the best thing about working in the chat space is that uh, some big developments in the, you might have heard of it, like ChatGPT came out in November, and so we started doing R&D around what it looks like to be in that wallet network where you, as your wallet, call it like, as your user wallet, you communicate 
with a chatbot, a chat agent, and the, the biggest new thing is that it has the context of your token holdings and your transaction history, and so it has more context on how to help you with your MetaMask troubleshooting or ENS uh, problems, and so that's like the big new thing, and that's like an information flow both ways, where the agent knows about your uh, transaction history. Um, and then the other thing that it's like a bi-directional flow of tokens where you can pay the agent 10 die for a ticket or an NFT, and it's actually a transactional thing. Um, it can also assist you with, um, we have a, I can show it after this, but we have a demo live right now of, you say like to the chatbot like, hey, I wanna sell 10 die, I wanna uh, buy two MKR, and it just gives you like a button to click, and it does that Uniswap trade for you. Um, so that's a way of how the chatbot can assist you with any sort of arbitrary DeFi transaction or basically onboard the next million people that don't know uh, kind of what they're doing and what they're being. like. It's just gonna be an assistant to help them. Um, and lastly, uh, we talked about co-ops, like the agent. Um, I actually got this idea from an idea I saw on Twitter where, are you guys familiar with like Calendly or like the calendar program? And so you could have a Calendly set up where in order to book a meeting with me, you have to convince my Calendly agent that's a worthwhile that's meeting. Worthwhile. You have to like, you have to chat with it. It's like kind of like a, a gatekeeper of, uh, of my meeting time. And you can do the same thing, but uh, the agent is dispersing co-ops or dispersing NFTs or just like once you think of how a chat agent can talk to a user wallet, like all these different features fall out of, fall out of it. Um, and so, and it's, they're like, these aren't fully announced yet, but the first three partners working with are MetaMask for their portfolio site, uh, ENS for customer support, and uh, MakerDAO for like a basic governance forum. Like they have a very active governance forum, and the idea is we pull in uh, governance data from their Discord, their forum, and their official Twitter every 30 minutes, and then you can ask the bot like what's going on in governance today, and it's just gonna it's gonna know what's happening. So yeah, there's a lot of exciting stuff there. Yeah. Yeah. That's super exciting. Uh, you mentioned chatbots, but you know, you, you didn't mention what's underpinning the chatbots, right? And this is obviously like a, a chat GPT ask agent. So maybe we can we talk about like I think probably realize one of the, the yeah. best examples of a of, of a live product that's integrated uh, open AI's you know, chat GPT uh, agents to actually do things in Web three. Um, so maybe we can like dive dive a bit deeper into that the whole. Yeah. So the easiest way is like there's three pieces of the bot. Uh, there's the data it knows. There's the logic and reasoning of it, and then there's the distribution. So we're using the XMTP wallet chat network as a distribution. Um, for the, so Drew, Drew here is my co-founder, he's, he's done a lot of the data side of it, like kind of DevOps. Um, it's called a embedding data, where you take the existing chat GPT, what it knows, and then you embed new data. So like a company's doc, documentation, like OpenSea documentation, and then all of a sudden it's chat GPT, but it also knows about OpenSea documentation. And so that process is called embedding. Um, it was a great, Company called a, it was called GPT Index. Uh, they rebranded to Llama Index, which is a play on the LLM, large language model is the term. So they're called Llama Index, which is great at kind of uploading all these different data sources, Discord, Twitter, uh, databases. Um, so that's like the data side of it. And then there's an excellent startup called Langchain, which is around like the 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 logic and the intelligence, the reasoning of the bot, which improves on above the base ChatGPT version. So I recommend that as well. Yeah, amazing. So you've got essentially like a, like a full stack, uh, we call it like a, a GPT enabled application uh, that you're adding context from Web3 to essentially help users uh, onboard quicker into the space. In a way. Yeah, yeah. And then like they're right there, like they've, they've already verified their wallet address. So like we know we're talking to the right person. We know they're one, one button away from recommending a MetaMask transaction or a helping them solve uh, Web3 doc documentation issue, so. Right on. Um, one, one edgy question to, to ask you, right, is, is just about AI, because it's on everybody's mind, right? GPT-4 just dropped, it's getting better, 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 better. Do you see, uh, you know, AI being overall as an amplifier more for humans, or do you see it as potentially being like a destructive force, and why? There's, like, there's a lot of trend lines in AI. There's, like, the amount of compute power it has, there's the cost of the compute power, there's the extra functions and reasoning it has, like the software development to it. And like all three of those are trend lines that show that 
these AIs are gonna get better and better. Uh, like ChatGPT4 that came out yesterday was finished training in August of last year. So that's uh, almost six months ago now and they're, they're working on GPT-5 and it's gonna be a ton better than, uh, <coughs> I don't know if you guys saw like the previous version that came out in November scored bottom 10%. If it, if, like, if it took the bar exam, if it was trying to be a lawyer, it scored in the bottom 10%. The one that came out yesterday scored in the top 10%. So that's, <laughs> so that's like, that trend line, um, it's a bit, it's a bit scary because like, if that trend line increases, it's gonna be, uh, like instead of asking for features to do for you, it's sort of like, it's gonna ask you to do, <laughs> so I, I don't know, I think there's a lot of, there's talk about this because OpenAI, the name of OpenAI started because they started as a nonprofit and open source, and I think probably from like speaking to the governments or DAR DARPA or whatever it is, like they decided, like I think I saw a story today where the president or someone high up was like, no, like I think everyone's gonna realize in a couple of years that these should not be in the hands of everyone in the world. That, like these are powerful tools that really are almost like uh, need to be controlled in some way, and so. I think you're gonna see a lot more conversation over the next year. So politicians getting involved, and yeah, a lot more. I, I think if you, if you want to see like both ends, like uh, both polarity, right? You've got like uh, Sam Altman, obviously, who's the founder of OpenAI, talking about uh, like GPT esque models, and then you've got like Eli Heiser Yukowski, who's on the other side of it, who's who's really like sort of against AI and thinks we should push back. And then you've got kind of like Elon right in the middle, who originally funded OpenAI, who's now like okay. I think has been advocating that they're way too powerful and that we need some government regulation for AIs. It's going to be an interesting space regardless. Who's who's used ChatGPT? Who's used 3.5? Yeah? How about 4, the newest version? Okay, yeah. What do you guys think? Game changer. Game changer? 100%. Yeah. Force yeah. multiplier all day. Force multiplier. One person becomes like 100 people. Now. Yeah. It's definitely an amplifier. That's like kind of the way I like to think about it. Um, let's move to you, uh, Julian, like a, a bit more back into the, to the founder realm of things, right? What does your day-to-day -day look like as a founder of Enzo? Um, do you use ChatGPT in your day-to-day -day actions, maybe creating documents? Um, just walk us through kind of like what you're doing on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, I think it's good for like outlining. I've been saying this all the time. I want to figure out a way, and I keep telling him on this, that he should, like if you think about shopping experiences, no one really likes it. Some people do, but a lot of people don't. They want to have these like choices that are like, given to them based off their previous purchases or what they like in their digital closet. And I honestly see this the future of fashion, digital fashion, AR try-ons, purchasing it directly through an application, etc. but also having all these recommendations. And I've been saying this since I was little that things are gonna become easier and easier for everyone, whether we like it or not. And a lot of times, like, yeah, you think of regulation, and it's like, okay, we've been talking about regulation for crypto for so long. And it also, yeah. <laughs> where has it? <laughs> um, but day to day for me, it's a lot of calls. <laughs> it's great because it's a mix between, like I would love to just spend all my time on the product and making it better and better. But the life as a founder CEO, you're a lot of times on partnership calls, fundraising calls, constantly. And if you're not, maybe you just raise money. But even when you just raise money, you already yeah, you're hiring, or you still need to keep talking to your investors every month. Or you have to keep searching of okay, when is your next round? And you have to be very strategic around it. And I think a lot of people forget that when you come into a company, you're responsible for other people as well. And you have to constantly be thinking of what's next. Um, but I love every single part of it. I think partnerships are so fun, especially when you talk about AI and how you can incorporate that into the business. But also, Web3 is all about building on top of each other. You talk to several different protocols and you're like, OK, how can we use you? How can we make you better? How can we make us better? And when I talk to other people not in the space, they always tell me the same thing. They're like, oh, well, you know, we just grow vertically. Like, we just have been doing this the last couple of years. 
And I think to myself, I'm like, oh, if you implemented this and this and this, oof, your life would be so much easier. <laughs> but yeah, day to day, it's a combination of everything. Also, like early stage founders, constantly you do every single role. And I think you should learn to do every single role really well. Um, whether you're technical or you're non-technical, you should at least understand what you're building so that you can explain that to investors or partners. Yeah, I think it's a really good way to kind of summarize it overall. How about you, Sean? What's the, what's the day to day look like for you? Um, yeah, just a little, like a lot of research into this new area. Obviously, like the AI stuff, a lot of research, a lot of understanding what's out there for the two startups I mentioned, like Lom Index and Linkchain. Um, and then I'm currently like fundraising for seed rounds. So yeah, it's a lot of uh, is it convincing other VCs and other people that it's a great <laughs> idea, both on the VC side and then also on these partners. <coughs> we call them like robots, where right now we have 23 different ones for different companies that so you can chat with it, learn about the docs. Um, and then we have two demos with doing a Uniswap trade and doing a ENS registration. You basically say like, like hey, is, is Sean Brennan .eth available? Uh, no, okay, how about this one? And it, you can actually go through in the chat context and do that. And so obviously those are just, we want to grow from 20 companies to 200, like every Web3 company can have one. And same for this interaction with the utility in the chat. So just a lot of uh, integrations and uh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, one thing I did want to ask you, uh, which we didn't get to, but I think maybe now's a good time, is kind of your uh, your experience at Infura and MakerDAO prior and how that influenced your ability to kind of found a company or new ideas to build something like uh, Relay. Yeah, so if you just kind of talk about that the experience there. Yeah, so I, I joined Maker uh, December 2017 after doing a hackathon and I was like point number like 20 there. So they had just launched uh, their first version. So like, who, who's heard of like DAI or like has ever used DAI, D-A-I? Oh, that's a lot of room. Um, so they just launched single collateral DAI. Um, I joined as like a JavaScript developer working on like the die.js library, kind of middleware to help work with it. Um, but I grew into a role where uh, doing a lot of uh, kind of like technical sales, but really you're just convincing someone they don't want dollars, they want die, and it's not really selling it, you're just telling about a cool new idea. And so, yeah, just had a lot of interfacing with different companies, and um, I think that the effect that's had on me is that it's, it's easier to find uh, collaborations, especially in like Web3. It's like you want to have find collaborations with other companies and find a way for your product to uh, you use their product, they use theirs, and like a lot, the, a lot of the biggest companies do that well. Like they've created these SDKs and uh, protocols to mutualistically benefit each other. Um, and in Fura, I was doing something similar around DevRel. Um, Consen the consensus mesh has MetaMask, it has Infura. Uh, back in 2020, there's maybe 20 other companies, but uh, right now it's Infura and MetaMask are like the, the main the main companies there. And it's like kind of going off what you said, like this crypto is a small group, but it's growing. But like the people you meet stay in it. Like I actually met Paul when at Airbus and worked with Airbus for a bit. And it's now six years later and we're here in the Edge office. Uh, Edge Wallet used to be called Airbits, and so like they're just there's a very small, great community, and uh, like the connection with ties you make here early, like we'll be here five years, ten years from now. Yeah, definitely. So maybe just like the sermons, like the, the networks you built at these companies help you kind of uh, not only gain ideas but also just build partnerships to kind of amplify what you're doing with Relay. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely helpful to be like oh like. We need to talk to Polygon, and it's like, oh, I went to Youth Bangalore and I met Sandeep, the founders of Polygon. It's like, oh, he's in my Telegram chats from 2019. How's it going? Like, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> right Maybe passing about Fusion. So you, you had uh, you know some time in VC prior, right? How, how has that you know helped you as a founder? Because you probably understand kind of the VC side of things and raising money a lot better than maybe first time founders who are like, I don't even know what like a post money valuation even means, right? Yeah, it definitely helps on fundraising, structuring, operational role. It also helps when you're first talking with a VC on how to talk to them, how to introduce them to the idea. 
um, what's the process that they're looking for. Most of the time, they just want to understand your vision and your team. And then eventually, they want to understand how big that market is. So you can paint that picture for them, whether it's in graphics, like any kind of inside your deck, you make a flow diagram, whatever it is. That's what they need to understand, because they're always going back to their LPs, which are their investors into the fund, and saying, OK, is this going to make us 10x of the fund? Because that's the investors, like the, the fund managers, they're promising that return back to the LPs who are the investors. So I always think about that every single time I go on a VC call. It's great, but sometimes it definitely strains the conversation a bit. Um, but I definitely think that experience and a lot of pitching, I constantly had to pitch because I also raised a fund. So I raised a fund. I also raised money for um, my own startup in the past. Um, but I think this time it's a little bit different. Uh, different types of investors, um, the market is different. Wish it was two years ago, last year. <laughs> but it's okay. I think it just provides more grit and uh, more experiences. And again, like things can be easy, but eventually it's going to get harder or it's going to get easier, whatever it is. But I think the more experiences you have in fundraising from the very beginning, it's going to get better. Yeah. What, one thing we, we talked about, and I'd love to kind of touch on this some more, is um, the difference between like VC investments versus grants, right? Because in Web3, there's a ton of grants opportunities. Those kind of come risk-free, right? Whereas when you take VC investment, there's this expectation that you need to return 10x, which puts a lot of pressure on a founder to deliver. And so maybe you could talk about the differences like uh, as a founder uh, going the grant routes versus going the VC routes and the sort of unlocks you get uh, versus one another. Yeah, going with a grant, um, it's great. It's not technically free. I mean, it is. It's equity free, but it also provides a lot of resp it, it, You have to give a lot of responsibility to that, and it's normally not as large as a VC investment, right? Like a VC investment, maybe minimum <laughs> check is like 100, 150, really early, or nowadays it's like 500 to 1 million. For, v, or for grants, it can range anything from a couple thousand. I know ENS right now is doing a grant program. If anyone's interested, you should definitely apply. They're giving one ETH to five different um, like teams. And from that, like it's either 1,000 or like 1,000 whatever, 700. And then it goes up to maybe 35,000 or 50,000 even. Some of the protocols um, like on the infrastructure layer or um, yeah, like they, they can provide a lot more because they have a lot more to provide. Um, but I would say try the grants first. Try to ship small products because nowadays it's really hard to raise capital from VCs pre-product. It's very hard. Um, also, it's so much better when you actually have a product to show because you can actually show traction from that and you don't have to prove yourself like the product proves it for you. And that's the best way to pitch to any VC. So my honest opinion is don't go for VC money unless you have a product and you have some traction. And otherwise, go for grants. Grants are great. Maybe you can't hire like 10 people, or maybe you start initially with a couple people, maybe one, two, or three. And you also work that way of like, OK, some get a little bit of equity, some get a little bit of grant money. Keep following up with grants. Um, grants also like provide like you like sometimes you can apply twice or three times, which is amazing. Lens has amazing grant program. Ave has grant program. Polygon like there's so many opportunities. You just have to do a little bit of research. Um, but I 100% agree. Like the first couple of months, or like at least maybe first half year, you go for grants, and then once you have a product, VC. Yeah, that, when you talk about hackathons and then going to like trying to start a startup. It's a good kind of heuristic to know, like uh, the hackathon bounty is like a few thousand. I think as a, as a chase, like you got the magic link bounty, so that's like it's great. And then their grant might be ten th like ten times that, um, and then a pre seed round is ten times that. So it's it's like it's a very nice stepping stone to uh, to get to like a first VC round, um, and also 
it is like a sort of feather in your cap where it's like one more piece of evidence of why you should get that VC grant where it's like, all right, we have this grant, like you guys can trust us, like we're doing this. You, you can also look back if you look at data and just see companies that were created in the last two years and got a funding, a funding of like maybe 1 million to 1.5 to 2 million. A lot of them are actually not around today because they couldn't fundraise again. And once you have that initial fundraise, it's so hard to move backwards. When you, you have to drop your evaluation, it's very hard if you don't even have a product. And a lot of times I say it's better to work with a little bit less because then you really like try, you figure it out. You, there's a lot of trial and error. And then eventually you'll get to a place where something works. And maybe that's even like selling a service. Down rounds aren't the fun, right? Yeah, 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 um, they're not. I, I think the, the heuristics you laid out um, like really kind of help frame it, like, right, as like someone that's um, maybe just finished the EFSD bootcamp, right? And then they go to a hackathon and they get, you know, two to four thousand dollars to kind of build on that idea. Then they raise, you know, uh, like ten thousand dollars in grants. They prove their validity, right? They've done a bootcamp, they've placed in a hackathon, they've raised grant money. Now maybe they're ready to raise VC money. And I feel like that's kind of like where we're at right now in the current, you know, current space with current, you know, uh, funding rounds happening. Like that might be the best roadmap as we lead into the next bull market. Um, so I, I love that framing. Um, speaking of products, like what are some uh, some of the more exciting products other than your own, obviously, that you find in the Web3 space? Uh, I know Lens is one. Um, we talked about ENS and Maker, but what are some other things maybe that came out of East Denver that you guys are really excited about and, and bullish on? I how many? He was that familiar with like the Nouns project, like Nouns DAO, and it's so, it's, it's a, it's the idea <laughs> that, <laughs> like, it's a, it's a sort of form of governance, it's an NFT where it's just, the smart contract says one noun, one NFT is gonna be minted every single day for the, for eternity. And there's a bidding auction, and if you buy that noun, like, the purchase of that goes into the treasury, the, the DAO treasury gets your purchase amount, and then because you have that now, you have one vote in how that treasury is spent. So there's like, a constantly uh, more votes and more money is going into the pot. And there's, it's like famously become very popular and one down goes for tens of thousands of dollars and it's like very community, but then there's like sub dials and communities coming off of it. And it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting way of self-funding governance where uh, instead of doing an ICO or doing some other scheme, it's a, uh, it's proven itself as a very interesting and new model for, so there's like one that I like, it's called NARS DAO, which is like, like NARS, like snowboarding group. And it's like, it's all about just kind of promoting like uh, athletes and like ski trips. And like, it's just like a, it's a fun idea. It's like a cool, it's a cool thing. Yeah, I think on, on the nouns, like they also have grants programs, right? We just spoke about grants. The other thing is like, they're one of the true, uh, you know, uh, examples of hyperstructure. Talk about hyperstructure if we want, but you know, there's there are these new funding models essentially that are composable and that live on the blockchain and creating opportunities for folks that want to get together and fund something. Right. How about you, Julia? Yeah, I think the grants for Nonstow is incredible. It's also really cool to just read through all the projects that want to build and get the actual grant money. And a lot of times they give out like they can give up to like twenty-five thousand dollars. I think I saw it once. Um, but for Nouns Now, it was really cool on the fashion side. There was this girl from NFT, uh, NFT Paris, and she actually 3D printed Nouns Now all over a dress. And I thought it was the coolest thing. I think the whole project cost like 150K, but literally like they funded it, and it, it's still, to me, the coolest thing. A little pop-up shop with just like a 3D printed I'm also really bullish on 3D print. Um, I think it's going to be the future, and if anyone's watched like Clueless and had the digital closet, I think that's the future. Um, it's all about that too, right? Exactly, yeah. it kind of fits together. Um, also, like Evan from Disco, I'm super bullish on her. She's also an incredible human, and we're doing something with her to have an address collect. So you could actually share your actual address to the merchant that, or to any profile that you're purchasing something um, through the Enzo app. Um, that's really cool. I don't know, I could go on. There's so many really cool projects. And all right, well, I have one more like 
Who here has a ENS name, like a dot e, dot e name? No. All right, so who, who does not? Yeah, okay. See me after. I'll help you get your first one. It's like a, it's a, everyone should have one. Everyone should have one. <laughs> not in a bucket board. Um, and a lens handle. And a lens handle. All right, cool. It's like the three main things. We've got some giveaways here. Don't go there, please. Um, all right, so speaking of bump coins, right, let's, let's pivot uh, to our last topic, um, which is ETH Denver, right? Um, what were some big takeaways from ETH Denver? Uh, what did you love? Um, what, you know, what are some of the events you went to? Uh, you know, you know, tell, us, tell us what you did. So I, I was lucky enough, I told my story about joining Maker in 2017. February 2018 was the very first ETH Denver. So I went as a sponsor, and there was a thousand people, more or less, in a in a huge building, it was epic. They had four different meetups that combined to throw that first year. Um, and turns out, what was it five years later, they've been having it every single year. They had one virtual year. Um, but suddenly, last year, that huge venue was trying to fit 10,000 people, and it was it was a shit show. It was like, they were like, oh, this didn't live to our standards. Yeah, <laughs> years later. Um, and so this year, they changed venues, 25,000 people came, 100 different sponsors. Um, it was a very like, well put on event. Um, and yeah, you just show up, like everyone, it was almost like a, what is it, a convention, like yeah. job fair, everyone's just hyped. There's six different stages with things going on. There's a, and the name Buffercorn is like their kind of mascot, which is a mix of a, a buffalo and a unicorn. And it's, so like it has clothes, fun. it's really fun, you can mix match. Yeah. I was thinking we were creating a digital closet for your buffet core. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, just like it started as a hackathon. Well, it is a hackathon foremost, but um, it's turned into the biggest North American youth event. Yeah. So, it's, yeah. so, so what were your biggest takeaways from this year specifically? Uh, Everyone loves merch. <laughs> uh, there is like zero knowledge and other like TID stuff around identity are the biggest trends, layer twos. Um, and I think the biggest trend that we're trying to push is like my shirt is says like Fun Up Matters from Gitcoin, which is about this like topic of regenerative finance where it's like, all right, now we have these new rules of coordination of DAOs and noun style. Like, how do we use that to fund public goods and put that, instead of like degenning and just trying to get one more ETH when we have whatever, it's like trying to put that to good use and rewarding the people that provably help some aspect of the, of the planet. Yeah, maybe, maybe before we jump to Julian, um, could you explain a little bit about Gitcoin, Gitcoin's history, and why it's such an important piece of infrastructure in the web space? Yeah, it actually started in Denver as well, uh, 2017 or 2018. Um, but it, the key part of it, the one of the main parts of it is they started doing something called quadratic funding, where people put in, um, say like rich donors like Vitalik, he puts in a million dollars of ETH, and like how does he know how to distribute that ETH? Like he doesn't, he, it's not he doesn't know like the best projects, and so the way it works is if you vote with your dollar, you donate like anyone can donate to projects, and if you vote. If you vote and donate one dollar to a project, um, basically a hundred people donating one dollar project is ten times better than one person donating a hundred dollars. So it's sort of rewarding the crowd deciding which projects are best, and so that's called quadratic funding. Where, um, and so they've had like fifteen different, sixteen or seventeen different rounds now. They've decentralized it, and they just run hackathons, and they they have this ethos of trying to give back and. Regenerative finance in the world. Yeah, yeah. Fun fact: we, we received a little bit of funding from from Gitcoin around fourteen, I think. Um, so it's, it's definitely helped, and uh, there's some really awesome open source projects on there. So if you're into uh, contributing to, to great projects, check out Gitcoin. Also, if you have a great project that you want to get funding for, um, we've got a couple of folks here who built something at, uh, at East Denver. Uh, maybe Gitcoin is a good alternative. Um, Julian, let's let's jump to you. Uh, what was like the, the biggest takeaway? The most exciting thing you experienced? Uh, yeah, so I planned an event. Um, it was a Women in Web3 Summit. I did it with Shefi. Um, 
a woman named Nagi. I don't know if any of you guys have seen her before on Twitter. Yeah. Um, she's incredible. She's been in the space for a while. And it's all about educating women for financial freedom. And I think that's incredible. She, she literally gets on a call like twice a week and teaches around 150 to 300 women at a time. And it's split into two um, sessions with another um, uh, instructor as well. Um, and we threw an event and had 150 women show up. And we actually had a line out the door. At first, we had to, like, because of capacity, we were only expecting around 100 people. Um, so we had a little bit of a line. But it was so incredible, because if you walk around even in Denver from last year to this year, there's so much more women in the space. And it's so important. I think it provides a great balance, but also to provide opportunities through education. And I think that's where it starts. Um, coming to events like this, hearing from people with, or just who have had any kind of experiences, and having a takeaway from that, I think is so important. And I love hosting events too. Um, that was definitely one of my biggest takeaways. Also, just um, being able to network with anyone and everyone being super open about it. Um, and yeah, it was just cool. Like this year was all about building, and you would see people working all day and um, exploring, and and it was for me. It didn't seem like last year was maybe a little bit more like a party, and then this year was more like people actually cared, had like goals, initiatives, and tried to make it happen, and that to me is incredible. Yeah, amazing that, that uh, you hosted about the Sheep. I think Maggie's definitely a force in the space, and she's doing amazing work getting more women, which is something we desperately need to see. Um, not just in Web3, but in tech in general. But if we can redefine this in Web3 as sort of this new emerging technology, that's one way that we can get closer to that goal. Yeah. Um, so, amazing. Uh, last question I have, and then maybe we can open it up for a few questions from the audience, is uh, where are we going to see you guys this year? There's a ton of events, right? There's uh, ETH Tokyo coming up soon. Uh, there's uh, ETH Paris, I think. Um, ETH Lisbon, right? There's, there's tons of events. So where are we going to see Sean and Julian this year? Well, so my site is Relay.cc. Actually, has an event listing. Relay.cc slash events. Check it out. Um, we, there's a NFT MIC. Uh, is April 10th. There's in Tokyo, which is right after that. Um, ECC is in Paris in July. And uh, there's a thing in Lisbon in June. Um, I don't know, like that. There's a lot of, there's a lot of options. You guys are worldwide. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to throw events in every single one of the spaces. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm doing uh, events at NFT NYC, if any of you guys want to go. I'm doing a pop up shop. Um, but it's going to be a combination of digital and physical, so you'll be able to have an AR mirror there, and you can actually try it on. Um, you can purchase it if you want, or you can just try it on and share it on social media. Maybe it doesn't relate to most of you here, but it's fun. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to be giving away some really exclusive merch, so that's going to be on-chain merch that you can connect to your digital closet. Um, and then ECC Paris is actually where we're going to release our beta. Um, so we're doing actually a huge event there for around 250 um, people, mostly sheep buyers, but everyone. In, I don't know. We're not opening it just for women, but there are going to be a lot of women in Web3 there. So we're super excited for that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Who's running this? <laughs> um, we're doing an exclusive merch drop um, for ETH Tokyo. So you will see it if you follow our Twitter and also our Leinster or whatever. Yeah, there's so many. Um, or follow our in, uh, Enzo. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think that's it, right? Yeah, there's, uh, yeah, there's just, there's a, it's a global community, and it's cool to see kind of almost collaboration between different like meetup groups. Like, you know, but I yeah, I hundred percent agree. Go to any conference you can. Like there's an ETH SF coming up. Um, I think it's in <laughs> October, 
Um, 100% if you can go to any conferences. Also, NFTLA is next week, if you can drive up there. Um, a lot of times you can get, um, if you petition or try to get uh, like ticket for free, a lot of times you can figure it out. Um, and I 100% recommend going. And like two years ago, it was three years ago, like the most, it's definitely been a shift in like NFTMIC or NFTLA, uh, changing from like very shilly 10,000 PFP projects just trying to almost scam you. But now it's, there's like one through music, there's things related to the, the nouns projects, there's a lot more quality projects, so yeah. Awesome. So, I think we'll see you guys in Paris. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone, let's give it up for uh, And then uh, maybe we'll take like two questions because we went a little bit over. Uh, thank you guys for, for staying with us. Oh, yeah. Thank you all for putting this on. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thanks for putting this on. Uh, anecdotally, I've been on the hunt to mint a uh, lens protocol handle for Gunstone. Mm, okay. And okay. I was supposed to be in LA to see a client, and they canceled tonight, so I'm really stoked. Oh, uh, <laughs> 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 oh no, I just jinxed myself. But uh, so. And anecdotally, I've been a social media manager for 18 years now, publishing skateboarding content and, and apparel and all things skateboarding and things. And I've had a blast on Lens Protocol with Orb and Favor and just a slew of apps, so it's been really fun. Like, so I'm, I'm stoked you're building on there, and I, I think you answered the question why you would build on there, and I, it's clear. Like, I've never seen anything so, so my question comes like from the, the uh, apparel side, with the exception of G Money's 9D, I don't know the 9D, yeah. Yeah. Um, are there any other apparel lines you're excited about right now? Oh, that are doing like physical and digital? Mm -hmm. So we're doing a lot on the merch side. We're starting on that side, which we're super excited. So Lens and Ave, if you've seen any of their merch, people go crazy about it. And I was speaking with Stani last week about how we could actually create a collectible out of that. Because yes, you have the physical, but you also have the digital. Um, there's a bunch of really cool, also digital fashion brands. Like for example, Dress X just raised 15 million, which is incredible to see as a digital fashion brand, which doesn't actually have any like physical pieces. I think that's going to be moving the community and also showing that you know there's opportunities in both digital and physical and having like a, a twin. Um, I also am super intrigued on like the hardware part. Um, I know that's not brands, but I think it's really important the connection between the digital and physical. And I believe that in the future, every piece will have its digital twin connected through some type of hardware. Um, so that's cool. That's it. How many people here have ever bought like in a video game or if you're in a video game, you're about like a skin or like a like a personalized uh, little piece of, yeah, like, all right, maybe half, but the of Lens is like, and what Enzo's doing is, like, you could be browsing social media and see an, like, see one of your friends or see an ad for, like, buying that digital piece of fashion, and it's, uh, it's just like a new, it's a whole new world out there, so. Quick shout out, I'm, I'm at streetart.lens. <laughs> streetart.lens for everyone listening on stream. Yeah. <laughs> How's it going, guys? Uh, great, 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 great talk, guys. I love it a lot. There's so much like dense information. I love this kind of time, even when the market's down, because it's like you get to hear real conversation instead of people just trying to make money off each other. It's fantastic. Anyway, um, Sean, I, I kind of had a, a mini question. It's not like really crazy, but um, I was super into XMTP for, for quite a while. I love what like what the kind of technology is doing. It's unlocking so much potential. Um, I'm kind of curious, like when you found out like XMTP kind of like one up, kind of like did that like messaging stuff. You, how did that pivot occur? Like, what happened with you guys internally? Were you guys like, pissed? Were, were you guys like advantageous? Did you, did you talk with the team? How was that kind of transition? Are you talking about like, I said like back in April we started using them? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, we were really, like I'm familiar with like the Elixir programming language and so like we're kind of rolling our own and like doing our own version of it. And then they've been working on that library, like their beta library for 
at least six months, and so they basically, like the, the core product that we wanted was helping people communicate with each other, and they just like dropped that SDK, and like, we're like six months ahead of us, so like of course we just started to use that, and like basically, we're like, great, now we don't have to build this. <laughs> I think maybe as like a follow up for, for both you guys, have you guys ever experienced a significant pivot uh, within any of your uh, companies in the past? And what was the structure around it? Like, uh, maybe you can uh, share with Jillian? Yeah, oh my god. I started as like a digital <laughs> physical marketplace. And the reason why I pivoted was I realized the point of discovery starts a lot from social media. So constantly we're scrolling and we're looking for new things. And I feel like in the Web3 space, there isn't anything other than Twitter that exists where people discover and find new things. Whether you're part of a DAO, you're looking through uh, like Discord messages, and I hate Discord, so I never got it. Um, but you want to look at you know friends you've met through a conference, or online communities are so exceptional now. I make a lot of my friends online, and then I meet them in person, and it's incredible. Because you realize that you created this relationship from the very beginning, and, and I don't know, it's just, it's crazy. You meet them in person, and it, yeah. But the pivot part is, and, and I think something interesting when you're saying like XMTP, like a lot of people think with traditional companies in the Web2 space, you're like, oh, that person is doing it. So I can't do it anymore, right? They're taking over. But really, you think like you're building blocks, right? You need to build on top of them to get to be better. And you also need users. Like it's so important to get users. And they say this all the time. Like there was like the last three years, it was just all about protocol, protocol, protocol. But now it's all about applications built on top of the protocol, like use cases. Because a protocol is one thing, but if there's no use case. But it's literally like nothing. It does not worth anything because you need more users for data. So I pivoted, and you pivot all the time actually, because you're still early stage. But it's a great pivot. It's either you're making enough to cover your burn rate and you're chilling, or if your startup isn't up until the right, you might want to consider a pivot. And for us, it fit in perfectly from us building uh, like the front end, like front end clients and mapping the product. So then that's the distribution for the back end like server, the chatbots that we're that we're doing. And so and I would, yeah, it, it made sense for us, but well, pivoting is super fun too sometimes. <laughs> Not all the time. <laughs> but it's great. Like imagine you're doing the same thing every day and then you realize that what you didn't been doing for the last six months doesn't make sense anymore. <laughs> and then you pivot. Awesome. Let's give it up one more time for Sean and Julia. Awesome. Uh, are we going to wrap up when? Sandals? Yeah. Maybe we can do what? Um, what do you think? How many people don't have lens for fun? Uh, Sean, you're okay. Wait, I heard one. <laughs> no, straight arms don't lens? Like, that's in my head now. Yeah, I think they can give away like. But I, I want to admit Sweet. my own. Yeah. I've been wanting to admit my own. I thought several on second before. I don't know. Okay, so we're, we're gonna do three. So if you signed up, um, give us five minutes. We'll put uh, all your email addresses into like one of those spinny wheel random generators, and then we'll meet back here in five minutes and announce three winners. That's not good. Okay. Uh, also, uh, real quickly, uh, who here registered for the event on Luma? Show of hands. All right, now keep those hands up if you did not get scanned in. <laughs> <laughs> just trying to get some yeah. here. Yeah. 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 This, yeah. this helps with metrics. This yeah. helps yeah. with show to you know to our uh, people. All about the day. But, uh, thank you everyone for joining. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, everyone. Yes. This is a perfect time.